Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Brandon Block. I'm an assistant professor here at UW-Madison. It's great to see such a good turnout for our uh, event today, uh, Sherman's and Tigers and T-34s, oh my, uh, which is being uh, sponsored by the George L. Mossy Program in History here at UW. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome to Madison Jeremy Best, who is an associate professor of history at Iowa State University. Uh, he works on uh, modern German history, international history, German-American relations, in particular themes surrounding race, religion, and culture. Uh, this is his uh, first book, highly recommended, uh, Heavenly Fatherland, German Missionary Culture and Globalization in the Age of Empire. Uh, it came out in 2021. Uh, and won the best first book award from Pi Alpha Theta, the National History Honor Society. Um, I really, uh, uh, someone who also works on religion, really enjoyed this book's uh, really fascinating exploration of uh, religion and colonialism on the eve of uh, World War I. So that's uh, highly recommended. Uh, but Professor Vest has now shifted to uh, a new project uh, called Toy Soldiering West German Rearmament the Holocaust in the United States, which we're going to hear about today. Uh, this new project looks at the origins of tabletop war games uh, during the period of Western rearmament and the construction of the Western American Alliance during the early Cold War. Uh, in particular, this complex relationship of gaming culture with uh, war memory and the Holocaust. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a different format from the typical academic talk, so I think we're all looking forward to this. Uh, Professor Best will first talk to us for about uh, 30 minutes or so, kind of laying out some themes of his new project. Uh, and then he's going to introduce some of these games that he brought, which I believe are some of the uh, kind of primary sources he's working on uh, in his project. Actually. Uh, uh, all right, well, <laughs> uh, and then we're going to uh, have an interactive session. So after his talk, we'll move to the, the back tables and play some of these games. Uh, Professor Best will, um, we're not going to do Q&A after the talk, they'll kind of facilitate the games, we'll answer questions at that point, and maybe we'll come back for a bit of concluding discussion at the end. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jeremy Best. Thank you. Um, is that, we'll just live with this volume. Thank you, Brandon, for that uh, really nice introduction. Uh, thank you to Sky Donnie for helping invite and arrange. Thank you to Nat, Ned, whose last name I forgot. I'm sorry, Ned, Ned for uh, logistical support. What's that? Frame. Frame, uh, as well as, oh, God, I can't see my own notes. As well as, uh, thank you to uh, the sponsors and hosts of the George L. Mossy Program in History, the Center for European Studies, and the Department of History. And uh, even more importantly, thank you to all of you for coming. This is really a, a lovely crowd. I'm excited. I hope we have enough games. And if we don't, we'll make it work. I promise you that. Um, I am, as Brandon said, going to uh, introduce this project. Uh, in, a, in a certain kind of way, I'm trying to be conscious of the audience we have, so I, I will... Oh, okay. We can see it, it's fine. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so that we can uh, kind of understand what I'm coming at, and then uh, Brandon was wrong, it's not his fault. These are uh, more contemporary games than I'm going to be talking about, but I will explain uh, how these connect to the project, as, or I can explain how they connect to the project in a wider way. Uh, so here is the topic, Sherman's and Tigers and T-34s, oh my. Uh, and there's my information if you want to follow up with me in any way. Uh, let me just start with a project overview. So uh, where I want to start is to explain to you that wargaming in the United States, and by extension in Europe, has fully adopted what, and integrated what is called the Clean Wehrmacht. I should ask for a sec there, there are some games out contemporaneous to us now that have uh, a more complete narrative of the role that the Wehrmacht played in uh, the atrocities of World War II, but in general these games have integrated this uh, myth, which I'll explain as we get closer to it, um, and it, it is persistent, that myth, in contemporary culture in the United States, and especially in gaming culture. The notion that the German military had almost no role in the crimes of the Second World War perpetrated by Germans and their collaborators, by the Nazis, I should say, and their collaborators, when in fact, uh, for more than 30 years, we've had well, since the beginning, but for more than 30 years, it's been completely accepted in the historical establishment uh, and generally in, in at least German popular cult German culture that the Wehrmacht is not clean at all, nor is the Luftwaffe or the Kriegsmarine. Um, so these are, uh, so these are. That's sort of part of what I want to talk about. And what I'm interested in is how did that happen? How did 
um, an American gaming culture that then, uh, in many ways, was transported back to Germany and became part of Germany's gaming culture, uh, although that's a question I'm still working on understanding. How did they integrate this myth into it? How do you get, and this is part of the larger project, how do you get Americans who in 1945 are convinced that you know, all Germans are, relatively all Germans are evil, that they're, they're all Prussians and Nazis, et cetera, and very certain of the criminality, uh, how do we get to this? And that's, that's maybe for another time more generally, but I want you to understand that's part of the project. And the project is triple barrel to understand this. It's a history of wargaming in the United States and Germany. It's a history of intellectual and technological exchange between cultures and across cultures. Uh, and it's a history of Holocaust memory. This uh, triple barreled approach makes for challenging research. Uh, it makes for uh, me having to engage with some new archives that I, I haven't in the past. Uh, the Heavenly Fatherland is, a, is an institutional history in many ways and an a intellectual history. So it's kind of archives of institutions, as I said, and then uh, published works by people who are involved. So a sort of fairly, I mean, there are challenges in its own way, but a fairly easy uh, place to find out how to get there. But how to track games is a harder one. Um, today's topic within this. Uh, or I should say that the current state of the project is excavating the linkages among these histories. That's where I'm at. I'm, uh, this is, I'm on leave this semester, I'm in research mode, so I'm mostly gathering information. But I have some ideas and some conclusions that I'm, I'm happy to talk through. I'm going to present the crux of the thesis of this work as I see it, and some evidence reinforcing how the history of American popular war games show the thesis to be correct. So how they prove my point. Uh, and my purpose here is, and in fact, as it says, to discuss the problem of accuracy. What does accuracy mean? What does it mean to be accurate? American war games became directed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s towards creating uh, the most accurate simulations they believed they could of war. And in the process, they came to see accuracy as inherently necessary for enjoyability. That only games that were accurate were good and fun. Uh, they claimed that this accuracy dictated their design choices, that they made the games in such a way because they had to make them accurate. Uh, yet, as I will show you, and I'm, I hope you can already understand that accuracy is a constructed definition, that what is accurate is to some extent in the, the eye of the beholder and or in the mind of the creator. And so I, I want to do that. Now, I, this, I can't assume that you know the, the basic history of war games, so I'm going to give a brief history, and I'm going to move a little bit quickly through this so that you don't get bogged down in details and wonder why I'm taking so much of your time up when we have the chance to actually touch and feel some games. So, uh, and this is a history in the modern era, and of course, uh, some histories trace war games all the way back to chess and precursor games. We're sort of leaping forward past the transition of chess from India and Persia to uh, Central and, and Western Europe. Uh, we're sort of leaping past that into the modern era and to start the, the sort of first modern war game that looks anything like the war games I'm researching are, are games that are collectively called Kriegspiel, war games, uh, in Germany. And so Germans are the ones who invent uh, the, the original versions of the war games that I'll show you in a second. Um, and there are two uh, key ones to talk about. The first is on the left here. This is Johann Christian Ludwig Helwig's Kriegspiel. He, pushed, he produced it in 1780 updated in 1803. Uh, it's called the Brandenburg version because he was a uh, sort of a state official in Brandenburg at the time. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's uh, a set of cubes. And the cubes are the terrain. And the little red things are the, the army, for, the forces, your soldiers or your, your units. Um, and this had two goals. It was served as an embodiment of the rules of war for education. So it was meant to train young men, young military officers in the rules of war, and to provide entertainment to its players. So it was, the target audience was always that audience, but it was also meant to be entertaining and to reduce the amount of chance in the game. It was, it was sort of a, a, meant to be scientific in that well, that it was all skill. And in this game, in Helvig's game, he introduces notions of terrain. He introduces notions that you have the freedom to deploy your troops as you see fit. Uh, these are all key features of future war games. Uh, variety in the game layout. These are modular. You can move these around and create different terrains. And uh, pieces representing the units of contemporary armies. So whereas in you know, chess is an abstracted, maybe at one time it was a literal representation, but it's an abstracted symbology of certain types of units. These are, there will be artillery units, there will be infantry units, there will be cavalry units. And they will have certain features. 
Uh, and so Helwig's version uh, got some attention. Uh, it was He made a very, very fancy version, presented to the Prussian king at one point. Uh, but it is overtaken uh, and preempted, or not preempted, but what's the word I want? Uh, replaced by what we can call the Ravitz revision. Um, a father and son, the father, uh, Georg Leopold von Ravitz, developed a re more realistic model, one that was meant to do away with the even the, the grid form and introduce something more like a miniature style board game. And so he used uh, contemporary tactical maps or versions of them, of real or, or style of made up places, uh, and used these sort of uh, wood figures uh, that you arrayed in your formations and your lines. Um, and this uh, was introduced during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Ravitz's, first, the older Ravitz's version was fairly successful, but it's really his son, Georg Heinrich Rudolf Johann von Ravitz, uh, took up this development after the defeat of Napoleon and uh, developed in 1824 a version designed, uh, this is what you're seeing here even more so, to be used at a tactical level, that is, uh, to use standardized units, and the goal here was to convey, quote, a realistic picture of events. Still, target audience is military officers. This game became uh, a, a central piece in uh, military education. It became a uh, sort of a social activity amongst officers. Uh, there was a certain expectation that you knew how to play and you would play in your downtime. It's sort of I guess you could think of it as professional development, but also for pleasure. Uh, Ravitz, the younger, introduced uh, the notion of having umpires. And while it was meant to be a game of skill, to deal with the problem of sometimes you order an artillery piece to fire, sometimes it misfires, sometimes the fire doesn't land where it's supposed to, he introduces dice. He introduces that randomness to, uh, to uh, account for that. <coughs> the, um, the umpires were meant to help, you know, the, to help... Uh, manage and make it as realistic and fair and make sure people weren't cheating. Um, and this Younger's game received even more endorsements uh, from the Prussian general staff and the king at the time. Kriegspiel became a component, as I said, of military education in Prussia, and new additions were developed to integrate new military technology over time. So Ravitz's version, uh, new versions come out that integrate railroads and different weaponry uh, improvements in artillery and the like. Uh, and you can see here, this is from a later period. This would have been playing an updated version. This is uh, a, uh, I never know what these are called. This is a, a print, I guess, uh, by Adelbert von Rüssler of uh, members of the German officer class playing a Kriegspiel. It's not clear, a Kriegspiel, it's not clear whether this is meant to be, they were used in planning as well, uh, not as strongly in the late 19th century. They become, actually in the 1920s, I found evidence that uh, the German Truppenamt, which was the secret general staff, was doing uh, lots and lots and lots of games uh, to figure out how to defend, or how to fail to defend Germany, they felt. Um, so this may be a social activity, or it may be actually a professional activity. Um, the fact that they're wearing the uniforms is no indication in either direction, I would say. Um, and this proliferated, and when Prussia had its series of military successes in the 1860s and 70s, uh, Along with some simple things, I remember as a kid we went to Fort Mackinac on the island in the lakes, and the, it's, it's built to the 1880s time, and the uniforms the soldiers were wearing were uh, pickle halba, and they told us that that was because the Prussians had been so successful, the American military wanted to imitate those, those helmets for a time. And similarly, this uh, Kriegspiel has a sort of vogue everywhere that they're seen, and, and I think it's not unreasonable that they might have played some role, but certainly they're seen as another way to catch up or keep up with the Prussians. And that uh, meant that as a professional game of military play, this is never really produced for the popular audience. It's a professional game of military play, Kriegspiel, uh, get established across the uh, Western world, the Atlantic world. Uh, before World War II, we can talk about popular game, war games. And before World War II, the popular war games, uh, in distinction from Kriegspiel, were much more orbiting around miniatures, around toy soldiers. And in the UK, especially, British popular attention on Kriegspiel did develop in the 1870s, but it manifested such that soon Britons began using their toy soldiers, which were becoming increasingly affordable and uh, realistic seeming, to uh, develop games that mimicked warfare. And uh, people designed their own rules and maps. Robert Louis Stevenson 
developed his own game. He wrote about it in a few places. Uh, we know a little bit about it. But the most important one from Britain is, uh, in 1913, H.G. Wells produces a book called Little Wars. And in uh, Little Wars, he detailed rules for how to fight little wars with your uh, little soldiers. He encouraged you to use uh, whatever you had to fight them in the yard, in your home. Uh, he grew this out of a game he played with his children. And in contrast to the Kriegspiel, Wells claimed that this was in fact a tool of pacifism. If people could play out their wars with their toys, they would never go to war in real life. Uh, in contrast to the Kriegspiel, which is at least at the time intended for simulation of war, for training for war. The, um, this is sort of where we can get in wargaming up to 1913, 1914. The United States, there is a little bit of playing with um, toy soldiers. And US military officers are doing some Kriegspiel. Um, but in general, American wargaming doesn't really take off till after World War II. So I'm eliding over some detail. I'm happy to talk to you about it more. But I want to get to actually the meat of what I'm working on, at least a little. There was an American version of the Kriegspiel in a book called Strategos, published in, 1880, in the 1880s by uh, Lieutenant Charles Totten. But, and war games did see this use. But some civilian games existed in basically private spaces, people making them up for themselves. Popular published war games uh, really um, don't come out. What is happening in the US is that military technology is developing at the RAND Corporation. The RAND Corporation is doing, behind closed doors, war games for the military. They're developing, a lot of this is devoted to figuring out how to do warfare with nuclear weapons or without, you know, how to exist in that setting. And, but generally, it doesn't cross over until 1954 when uh, Charles S. Roberts, in 1954, he published a game called Tactics. And Tactics is the first modern war game of the, of the sort of type that uh, we're talking about, which are these military simulations. In 1954, he publishes it. Uh, he claimed no knowledge of the earlier versions. He claimed that he kind of came up with this on his own. But it's very clear when you look at it that he is drawing on um, Kriegspiel models. Uh, and in 1958, he updates it to Tactics 2. And in Tactics, he established certain norms. Right, that you would have a grid map, like the Ravitz games and other civilian version, wor versions, and he publishes this game through his newly founded Avalon Hill company. And the, uh, he, he does innovate with the introduction of a, of a combat results table. I don't have previews, so I'm not, yes. So, um, and I'll show you, that's what you can see here. Uh, his cardboard pieces use uses standard NATO symbology. And in 1958, they come out with, Avalon Hill is, is quite successful, and they come out with Gettysburg in the same year, which is the first of these modern war games to, uh, to recreate a real battle, or a historical battle. And in 1958, they, are, they soon follow this with Chancellorsville in 1961, D-Day in 1961, and Stalingrad in 63, a game called Africa Corps in 64, Battle of the Bulge in 65. What I'm showing you, the most important thing is this, well, these, these are interesting, but this is the combat results table. This is the, the technology of how to deal with the abstraction and the uncertainty. And so you will calculate, and there, there are combat results tables in the Kriegspiel, um, so I, I guess I shouldn't say that he invents it, he introduces it to the popular world in a different way. For example, in Little Wars, the main way that you actually knocked anybody down was you had little pop gun cannons that you fired. And if they hit the little soldiers, they went down. They later get more specific rules, but, but this is, this table, is, uh, and, and this table is uh, an example of the technology that becomes central to this system. And soon imitators and competitors arrive. The most significant of these is, is uh, Simulations Publications Inc., SPI. Uh, but there's also um, Game Designers Workshop, which grows out of a group of students at Illinois State University who establish, uh, initially they, they claim that they're producing a, I mean they are, but an academic approach to studying war, but they're really wanting to make games. Uh, TSR, the company that publishes Dungeons and Dragons, and is the company of Dungeons and Dragons. They, uh, for a time, are a competitor as well. Eventually, TSR buys uh, SPI and comes to own Avalon Hill, uh, and then Wizards of the Coast buys Avalon Hill, and now Hasbro owns all of this. So, um, the 
to get to some of my research here, so this has been, I hope, interesting, but I want to talk about um, this question of accuracy that I talked about and why that is this fundamental understanding of what's going on here. And I want to present two game designers from the late 1960s that help us understand how accuracy comes to dominate in the war game genre. And they're, they're two, uh, they're actually, I don't know if they were friends. They knew each other well, they worked together consistently, and uh, the man on the right, Sid Saxon, I think everyone liked. The man on the left, Jim Dunnigan, I'm not sure everyone liked. And I don't know uh, for sure. But these two men uh, designed two war games. Well, they designed lots, particularly Dunnigan. But I want to look at two games they designed uh, in a moment. But I want to tell you about the two of them. Sid Saxon is an older, uh, the older of the two, he's born in 1920. He uh, originally was a civil engineer. But he was making his games on the side. His most famous game is the game Acquire, which is an uh, economic real estate simulation game. Uh, he makes a fair amount of money on that, and then he decides, not enough to really know he's making, getting rich, but he decides to try and be a, a freelance game designer. And he does succeed. He doesn't make a ton of money, but he makes lots and lots of games. He uh, writes reviews of games. He writes a book about games. He uh, writes lots of books that have games in them, and he uh, is very much immersed in the New York City game design crowd, which there is one in the late 60s. And so he's a bit older uh, than Jim Dunnigan, but he's, uh, like I said, sort of friends. He wrote game reviews for a magazine Dunnigan was publishing called Strategy and Tactics. Dunnigan was born 23 years later. He was born in 1943, so he's a different generation. And I haven't fully unpacked how much that matters, but it it's just something to know. He served in the U.S. Army from 1961 to 64. Uh, he graduated from Columbia in 1970. But even before graduating from Columbia, he starts designing games. He publishes a war game with Avalon Hill called Jutland, or Jutland, uh, in 1967. Uh, he becomes disgruntled with Avalon Hill. He thinks that they're, it, it's not completely clear, but at least part of his critique is that they're too interested in um, whether or not games will sell, and not enough in whether or not they'll be accurate, even though he thinks that accurate is the key quality. Um, and he starts his own company, that Simulation Publications Inc., SPI, uh, with other like-minded designers in 1969, and that game company finds a very happy audience, and in fact, by the early 70s, it's competing with Avalon Hill, the, the founders of the genre, and has its own uh, health, very healthy line of games. And in 1973, each of them publishes a war game. And I want to juxtapose them against each other to show you what I'm talking about when it comes to authenticity or accuracy. Sid Saxon publishes a game called The Major Battles and Campaigns of General George S. Patton, or uh, in his own notes he just calls it Patton for short, or the Patton game. And Dunnigan publishes among many, I think he published multiple games, but I chose this one because the Ardennes Offensive. So in both of them there is an engagement with the Battle of the Bulge. And so what I want to talk about first is Patton. So Patton, this is what a board of Patton, this is actually, I couldn't find images of the bulge. So this is Sicily was one of the other battles included it. But um, Patton and Sid Saxon designs this with Bob Champer and assistance from a man named David Isby, uh, both of whom worked with SPI and Avalon Hill. This is part of that network. Um, and but he publishes it with Research Games Inc. The focus of the game, uh, it it will be very clear when I show you the other game, is playability and mass appeal. Saxon wants a game that people will buy and play and enjoy and be done with it pretty quickly. Not done with it, not liking it, but having played through the game. Uh, he repeatedly stressed that the game, quote, played well, and he spent a lot more time in his design and focused on the aesthetics to make it appealing. Um, and I'm not denigrating Sid Saxon's work. I'm just telling you his priorities here were these. Um, when designing the game's Normandy scenario, Saxon researched with SPI games, in particular an SPI game called Breakout and Pursuit, which was about... Uh, patents about the breakout from Normandy in uh, August. Don't, don't call me out if I'm wrong. August 44. Uh, he said it was a lot of work and not fun. That's an SPI game. Uh, he, in contrast, Champer's prototype for Breakout of Normandy, the version from this, played well. He also, um, and as you can see here, the game does not pretend to reflect the topography of Sicily, does not pretend to have the real roads of Sicily. These are all of them about the same length. I mean, some of them are adjusted for the sake, nor are the units identifiable as anything other than their color and their type. This is a game that is about appeal, right? About people being able to play it and play it quickly, and it does well. It sells fairly well. It makes him money. 
Um, in contrast, in 1973, this is a part of the Ardennes Offensive by Jim Dunning from SPI. On the other hand, he told Saxon about Patton, quote, some people felt cheated when they bought Patton. The only thing I can think he means is that they thought they were getting a game more like this, and they got Patton. Because that's the only audience that, Pat, that, uh, that Dunnigan's really engaging with. Um, more mildly, another employee of SPI, Richard Berg, who would go on to make games, he uh, said the game was, quote, much too simple for him and too much luck. He referred to extreme complexity. These are from Sid Saxon's diary. He wrote down almost everything that happened in games to him. But as you can see in this, there's a couple... Um, well, let me repeat, those critiques of Patton capture the dominant approach to Wargames at that point. Patton is an outlier in the kind of games that are coming out. There certainly is a genre of that kind of, um, and I don't mean this as pejorative, but I think as casual games, or, or easy entry games, that's a genre, but this is, this dominates. This is what people mean when they say Wargames. This is, becomes dominant, and you know, here, Dunnigan and others are emphasizing historical accuracy. Dunnigan claimed in, in different places that the point of his work as a war game designer was to, quote, show that war was not simple. He put simple in scare quotes. He critiqued his employer, Avalon Hill, as I said, for having, quote, compromised much of what was valid history in order to produce playable games during its early years. And in a marketing report he produced for Avalon Hill, he noted that, quote, historical realism and authenticity, authenticity are essential for the AH Avalon Hill type game. He follows up with explanations of how to defend against, quote, nuts who doubt by including historical data in the games. So um, what you see, this is the, the, the tactics. Square grid is converted to a hex grid. Actually, the second version of Gettysburg is the first game that introduces the hex grid. Um, these are often called uh, hex and counter games for the hex grid and then the counters. These cardboard, this is like a, if we, and this is a, not in my project, but I think it's one that needs to be done, is a technological history approach to this stuff. This is a technology and a methodology. And as you can see, um, even on these, you can see that these, what you see, these letters around them are often attached. In fact, you can see here with the first SS, they're attached to specific units. They are absolutely, at least to the best of the knowledge of the designer, units that were present. And often put in the starting point that they were whenever the game started. Or with certain restrictions on where you can place them. So there is a, a real emphasis on recreating. The, and then the terrain here, they've, they've morphed it to fit the hex. But this is meant to reflect as accurately as possible the terrain here of the Ardennes. So those, the green areas are forests, the darker green are black, that might be rougher forest. I, I, don't, I have the game, but I'm not remembering. Uh, roads, fortifications, etc. all appear here. Objectives, etc. And you can see this is a wholly different approach to game design. Right? It's, um, in addition to what you see here, and I already mentioned that these are units that were there. The order of battle, the list of units in play, was meant to be accurate and reflective. Uh, frequently, historical photographs were included in the packaging, which I would say make a sort of discursive claim to these are real pictures, so that, that is, this is real, right? This sort of connection of the, the, the authenticity and actually the photographs. Now, my project is somewhat interested in this, but I'm, I'm, as Brandon's introduction said, I'm really interested in this connection to Holocaust memory. And where we get at that is in Eastern Front games. And Eastern Front games uh, exist in this genre from the beginning. You'll recall that in those first four I showed you, Stalingrad was one of the first four games that was made. Every publisher had to have a Stalingrad game, or several. Um, Dunnigan's company, um, tactical series games, which was a precursor to SBI that was working with Avalon Hill, had three different Stalingrad games at different scales, for example. Um, the example I'm showing you here is from the mega game, Drang Nakosta, produced by Game Designers Workshop, also in 1973. Uh, and I've just got a little bit of evidence here. So first of all, here you can see this is, uh, I believe, a photo taken at the very beginning of the Barbarossa campaign in the game. Uh, you're looking southward from uh, the Baltic. And so you can see these chits and counters arrayed. Sometimes these games force you to put them in there where that unit was at the very beginning. Sometimes they let you have a little bit of freedom. You know, you could deploy with a little variety, but generally not too much. And then this is an example of the order of battle. And you can, uh, Dragonlock Ostin goes down to battalion scale. And so these are many, many different 
units, the, the coding here is, but I just want you to see this is the starting order of battle for the neurons. This is the units you get to put in play from the beginning. So there is a real, real emphasis on detail and accuracy. And the scale of drawing out ghosting, which it's, it's, it's five maps that take up more than this table. And the scale is, again, meant to emphasize detail and accuracy, right? You can get way down and figure out what your units should do. And they use the same visuals and claims of authority. If we've done, the, if designers have done the research to produce the exact right order of battle, then we must be right. Or at least we can make fair claim that we're right about everything else. Right? We've done the research. We are experts. And I, I'm not saying that they aren't a certain kind of expert. But there's a certain kind of knowledge that they're producing and promoting. And this historical context also encourages a certain level of role play. You are, and the, the text for these games all says, or the advertising, you can take the chance to take on the role of the general. You can be the general. You can send your troops forward. You can maybe succeed where someone did not, or you can uh, do even better, etc. So it encourages a certain identification with the struggle. And these uh, simulation games, and here's where I want to transition my shot and then hand this off to you all, um, depending on your feeling about these games, being mad at me, or <laughs> wanting to hear more, um, or fascination. So I want to talk about a couple theoretical things that we need to know about. So simulation style games dominate the war game market. They still do. The ones we're going to play are not simulation as much. Um, and there's been some shift, but these counter and shift games still march on uh, very successfully. So one thing we can talk about is that uh, we can use ideas taken from the game designer theorist Ian Bogost, his name there, uh, about procedural rhetoric, that games have rules and processes which make claims about how the world works, that a game in its structure and in its way it's made makes a claim about how the real world works, whether even in an abstract game, but in these games they're not even all that abstract. And so these games, I agree, have an argument and make claims about history and war. And so what claims do they make? Well, one claim they make is that um, war is this. War is generals in the field looking at maps, making plans. They make that claim about World War II. These games have no interface or interaction with the Holocaust. This is a well-known document. I don't have my notes specific name, so please forgive me. But it is a record of the actions of one of the Einsatzgruppen reporting on the murder of Jewish people in the Belarus up through the Baltics. These games have nothing to say about this. These games make an argument that war is this, World War II is this on the Eastern Front. I will pause and I will say I'm not suggesting in these games you should be able to do that. But these games are feeding into the world, and I am a gamer, my, I brought these. But they are feeding into the world a version of the world of the Second World War with embedded authority, right? An authority of expertise, of simulation, that says that's World War II. We don't know anything about that. So that's one point. More broadly, so that's like a critique as a German historian that I make. More broadly, as a sort of game studies scholar, we can say they desanitize warfare, right? They turn it into uh, moving your pieces around. They turn it into, if you picture in your head, ordering your, your Panzer IVs across the wheat fields towards an unseen enemy that you will drive before you. And they leave out, frequently, the reality of, for example, the anti-partisan campaign, often called the Bandit War, in which uh, villages and civilians, as well as perhaps some partisans, were uh, murdered wantonly by German occupation troops. Right. The games say war is between soldiers. The games do not talk about the social cost of war very often, the cultural cost, the ideological, or even the political elements of these games of wars. Right? Frequently, in other papers I've talked about this, frequently you have no explanation why the Germans are invading the Soviet Union. They just are. Sometimes it's because Hitler's evil. Or sometimes, sometimes it's because it's a natural design. It's almost sort of like the Germans always will invade Russia. They will always do that. There is, there is nothing that is in the nature of, of Germany and the Soviet Union or Russia. Uh, and then we can come back to something I introduced, which is the clean Wehrmacht myth. These games have that embedded in them. Right? I've already, I hope, 
sort of you see the point I'm making. But they go even further. Uh, in the sequel and expansion to Drang Nakosten, Unen Shiden in 1974, they introduced partisan rules. And the Soviet commander can drop partisans on the map and interrupt the activities of the Germans in their back territories. And the game has a couple rules around that. One is you get these so-called police units. These police units, and this is coming from a scholar, uh, Gemma Alonga, who points this out. These police units are clearly meant to represent the reserve police units, the order police, the um, uh, auxiliaries hired from other ethnic groups of Eastern Europe, um, quite likely um, SS units, SA units, Einsatzgruppen potentially. These units have very little military utility, but they're very good at dealing with partisans. And also in this game, uh, SS units, the identified SS units. So you can ordinarily clear out a partisan. This is a detail, but you can just by moving just next to a partisan with one of these units. You don't have to fight them. And in other games, similar rule. But an SS unit only has to get within three squares of these. So the SS here are being shown as being better at this job. And what is that? That's an illusionary sort of camouflage of the actions against Jewish people and against uh, Slavic people, against the disabled, against the Roma and the Sinti. These games uh, perpetuate that because they don't talk about it. And the, the upshot here is that by sort of creating this visually and compelling case of being accurate simulations, they have embedded this in all knowledge of World War II in games. So. Uh, the Call of Duty games from the last 20 years or so very much frequently have this sort of clean, they do have this clean Wehrmacht myth in them. Even when they deal with the Holocaust, they don't really uh, talk about this. And so that's one critique, that's sort of the heaviest one. I, I also just want to note that the precision these games have often elevates trivia over meaningful knowledge. And so, um, I'm sure not to put them, Brandon's had this experience, Sky's had this experience, you teach about uh, World War II, and, and a lot of folks want to know why you're not talking about the equipment and the biographies of certain specific generals. And as German historians, we, we work at something at a level that is generally that's lower level than what we're talking about. And it's a way of sort of shifting the attention away from politics or ideology. And, and you know, I don't, I think that I've already made this point that there's a flattening of morality in these games and that there's an erasure of history beyond the games. And I, I want to end by saying I'm not, I'm sure we have people who play these games, I'm sure we have fans of these games, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to open your eyes a little bit, if they haven't already been opened, if they weren't already open, and maybe some folks who don't know anything about these games, to, to there's something going on here that we can elevate our awareness a little bit and think about what it means to play these games. Um, a, a, a very close connection would be, for example, Dungeons & Dragons has been getting a lot of critique for its, its portrayal of race, uh, rightly so in many ways, in its way of handling race. That critique has not, does not have to lead to people not playing it, but knowing about it is, is important. That's where I'm done. I think I'm on time, but not too badly. Yeah. Um, and so what I want to invite folks to do is to uh, check out these games, make some friends, because what we've got, I haven't counted, um, Undaunted, and Memoir 44, I've two copies of each. Those are, um, they can be two player games, but they can be four. You can partner up and work together to make your plans. Um, Blitzkrieg is a two player game. There's two copies of that. And Quartermaster General plays six. But again, we can partner up or people can observe. You may not have time to finish a game. You may not know how to play any of these games. But these are all chosen explicitly because they are pretty quick to get into. You may not play them well. You may not play them perfectly. But you can get started on them. Just open the rule book up. Go to the, they almost always have an introductory scenario that is just set up, and go from there. That's my encouragement, and I will, I will check it around. I'm guessing there are folks who have played these games, and I would encourage them to maybe make some new friends and help some folks learn the game, if you're comfortable. If not, it's okay. Um, and I'll be circulating to take questions, uh, as well as trying to help you learn the games, but we're going to need a certain amount of, you know, boldness. <laughs> Get in there and try. Uh, only other thing is that half of these are mine, half of them are borrowed from a friend, so please just 
keep in mind, that I, that I would like them to survive. And I know you're all adults and they will survive. It's just, I have to say it, um, my own anxiety wouldn't let me not. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've gotten the gist and enjoyed this, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions as I want. takes a very high level totally view. Did it feel like it reflected the complexities of World War II at that level? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean? No. I mean, it's, it just makes it into, you said this, the weapon, the tanks, the, sure. the like, uh, physical things that, you know, none of the actual politics of it, ideologies. What about the, the squad level games, Uncounted or Memoir? Sometimes we need some luck to win the, yeah. the war. Mm. Were the games you played, the little bit at least, were they fun? Yeah. 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 Do you think they'd be more fun or less fun if they were more accurate? Less fun. Less, less, fun. Fun. less fun. Less fun. There is a tension between yeah. accuracy. This is what the, the fun and accuracy. And you'll find, I, I come across in Dunnigan, particularly his, his papers, this real like sense of like um, the game, like, how do we square the circle? And there's a lot of evidence that guys, they're mostly guys, I'm sorry, men, were not playing the games they bought. It took too long to set them up. It took too long to play them. It was hard to find someone who would commit to a whole day of playing. If you found someone, the people who found folks like that, that was amazing. And you found, it, it, it had an effect of finding your people too, right? Like finding the, the person who got it, even if it was just one part of your life. And so there's. There's another thing that I'm moving more towards is thinking about, you didn't get to see, I should have brought at least one example of these. These games being more understood as like projects. There's one source that suggests they're like engineering, pro like you create a machine that you kick into motion and it recreates the war. I think of them as like history texts that are written in some ways, like here's my, and here's my thesis and argument about what mattered. And in the rule books, they'll be 20, 30 pages long. The first 10 to 15 will be the rules, and then there will be anywhere from one to 10 pages of historical background, which is narrative history of what really happened, what happened. So I think it's, it's really interesting to think about the, the sort of relation between a game and, and history in that way. Um, mostly I just have more trivia like they have. It's also interesting though, like, that you move a certain amount, a certain number, you mm -hmm. know? Like, what does that mean exactly? Like, well, they mapped that out. Yeah. The, the, uh, a, the, a Panzer division, or sorry, a German tank division could move, what, 50 miles over land in, in wow. two days or something like that, two days or 100 miles by, by road, and so the distances they move on the map are almost always. Yeah. I think what, one point that interests me in particular is you, you mentioned the sanitization of war. Yeah. I, I think it also sanitizes the experience of the commander, right? Or, or and the people fighting this war, right? Like, I'm sitting here maybe with a cup of coffee, playing with, you know, getting the next to a war and fire, whereas these people were on the front day after day living with the, the sounds of shells and sleep deprivation and malnourishment. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can't really make those the decisions the way they would have made them because you lack so many of those personal and experiential factors. Well, and yeah, I, that's an excellent observation. I mean, I think there. Their games. I, I'm not. You want them oh, yeah. to be fun, but I'm not. I don't, I'm not. I'm not saying you. I'm not challenging you back. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So there's all. There's never gonna be. You're never gonna get there, right? You. <laughs> you wouldn't like have a game and like makes. I, I, you see, I don't, I'm trying to remember. There's some. Uh, oh, like battle chess. There was that for a while. There was this thing where um, Sergei Klitschko, the the Ukrainian boxer, was also really good at chess, and he was gonna box someone else and play chess. Like chess box. Chess. There's like one. Yeah, it was like. How many, how many turns of chess, and then they would box for a round, and then they play. It's sort of like, I only bring that up to be like, you can't recreate. <laughs> They're like, he's like, you know, it's like Mike Tyson's like, everybody's got plans to get punched in the mouth, and like, everybody's going to win chess. Except, like, but on the, the other hand, like, it, it could be a bit reflective of how 
high level planning of wars, Detach but right then here. it is in the abstract. They're yeah. not the ones, you know, the high level generals. They're not actually physically actually in the war. Yeah. It is kind of a game to them. Yeah. Or potentially. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. This is, this is just open up some eyes, show you some stuff I'm doing. I, I like your, your message about, you know, obviously there are things that don't show up in these games that are history that everybody needs to hear and should be learning. And yet you can't put those kind of things in a game. If you, I mean, it simulating the Holocaust. They're horrible. You know, you, can, you, you couldn't get people yeah. to do it. And I, I think, yeah, so, uh, you're right. You know, and you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, and if I, if I, you know, some point, this, I've, I've done little things where people, and I gather some folks are somewhat in this community of, of hobbyists, but, you know, hardcore hobby communities, uh, one answer to my, this kind of presentation, well, well, you're saying we should play the Holocaust then? And it's like, no. Like, it's not that at all. That should absolutely not be anything you do. And I can tell you as an aside, uh, there are white supremacist games that are designed uh, to do that um, in very dark places. There's a, um, there's a game that I came across produced by an alternative game company called Gestapo Monopoly, which they claim, and so this was when a lot of these games were mail order in the early days, and they claim that it was a joke in the office, but somehow it got in the advertising, and people bought it, and so we had to make it. And um, it's, it was a company that always had a little bit of uh, irony to them, and in the term's not relevant to the time, but a little bit of edgelord behavior to them, if that's already a dated term a little bit, but it's sort of like just provocative for the sake of provocation. Um, but that, those games are, um, that to me is indicative of a certain attitude towards that part of the history that it's, it's and look, to be fair, like horrible things, sometimes we joke about them to make them a little less horrible. I don't think this was in good taste, but there may be that. I tend to think it was more just a bunch of um, in this case, young men who had very little sensibility about what was appropriate, but but I don't want that, right? And there are games, there are games about trying to assassinate Hitler. That uh, there's a game called Black Orchestra where you team up to try and assassinate Hitler. It's a cooperative game, but there's certain politics embedded in the game. But one of the things is the Holocaust is present in the game. The only time the Holocaust ever comes up is you're you're an individual in the in the conspiracy, and you need to be motivated enough to kill Hitler before you can even try. And one way you can get motivated is learn about the Holocaust. Which, and you can visit the death camps to up that. But the characters, I mean the other part is most of the characters you can play as in the conspiracy were members of the military general staff and so forth. And they were not motivated by ending the Holocaust, generally speaking. They were motivated by other things. I mean, sometimes a little and some more than others, but that was not a universal, certainly they weren't, most of them were not going to keep doing it, uh, but they weren't. That was for other reasons, well. So that's that's what you made me think of. Your comment, but thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.